Anyway, we're thrilled, thrilled to have uh, Maxime here with us today. Uh, Maxime, as you know, is the CWA chairman. And uh, in 2019, he won the Crime Writers Association Red Herring Award for Lifetime Achievement. Many of you know this, but not everyone probably. Uh, Maxime has worked for years in book publishing as an editor, including titles by William Golding, Peter Aykroyd, Oliver Stone, Michael Moorcock, Peter Ustinov, Jim Thompson, David Goodis, Paul Abelman, etc., etc. He also ran a bookshop, Murder One Bookshop, which he owned and ran for over 20 years. Have, and have some of you uh, gone to Murder One Bookshop? I bet you have. Crime books. Um, he now writes, edits, and translates full-time in London. Um, the Times called Maxime the king of the erotic thriller. <laughs> and uh, his first novel came out in 1997, and it, the title of it was It's You That I Want to Kiss. Is that right, Maxime? It is. It's, and nothing, the, nothing personal. <laughs> the two most recent ones, I guess, are the ones you gave me to uh, dis discuss tonight with you. We're going to discuss a little bit about the Piper's Dance and the Louisiana Republic, both of which are available now. So Maxime lives in London, and he was born in the UK, and he was educated in France. Where in France, Maxime? In Paris. In Paris? Okay. Um, and... Uh, Following a career in book publishing, uh, he opened the bookshop, and but now he's pretty much a full-time writer and editor. He has two books of erotic photography, as well as many acclaimed crime collections. Not only novels, he does anthologies as well. A number of these have been quite famous. Um, and uh, other books that he's written have included Because... She Thought She Loved Me, On Tenderness Express, The Word of Women, The State of Montana, Kiss Me Sally, Confessions of a Romantic Pornographer, and more. <laughs> he um, often, he, com he um, compiles two annual acclaimed series uh, from the Mammoth List, Best New Erotica and Best British Crime Fiction. <laughs> Um, and he's, a, he's won the Anthony and the Carol Awards, and he's a frequent uh, guest on TV and radio, and you're going to see why in a minute, because he's a very good speaker. He's also been a columnist for The Guardian, and he has been the literary director of London's Crime Scene Festival. So we have a star with us today. Um, I asked Maxime before this which uh, books he would most like to talk about, and he said the last two, Louisiana Republic and the Piper's Dance, which we will be doing in a minute. Um, so, Maxime, many of your works are anthologies. Um, so uh, uh, would you like to talk a little bit about, uh, for the people here in the group, um, how do you select your authors for anthologies and I have a specific question. If you want 15 stories, do you hire 20 authors because some drop out? Or what is your process for doing an anthology? Well, basically, it, depend, it depends on every book. Every book uh, is, uh, has its own uh, theme or concept. Uh, some of them are reprint anthologies, in which case it's just a question of reading. I mean, you mentioned that I do uh, the annual best uh, British Mysteries, that came to an end a few years ago, but uh, that uh, I think uh, lasted 15 years. And that was pretty, pretty um, the criterion was pretty simple, was to read every short story by a British or Irish author published in the previous year, uh, both from UK sources and American sources or even radio, or radio plays and making a selection of the best. So that was pretty straightforward. Um, then you have... Uh, what I would call the, uh, the standalone anthologies, I anthologies which either have a specific theme or um, are basically new stories. A few years ago, I was contacted by Titan Books uh, to become one of their anthologists um, when they were moving away from science fiction and doing more crime. They now do both in equal quantities and... Uh, we, we, they were basically they wanted a big anthology, but they wanted big names. Yeah. Uh, and you got was, them. <laughs> well, I managed to get quite a few. Uh, I pulled in some favors. I reminded Lee Child that um, I published his very first short story 25 years ago. So Lee wrote 
what's basically to become his final short story. <laughs> uh, and other people like uh, Jeffrey Deaver, uh, James, uh, James Grady, who's a very good friend, uh, who's lesser known these days, but wrote Six Days of the Condor and is one of the best uh, American uh, thriller writers, in my opinion. Uh, Denise Minor wrote a story in the UK, Stella Duffy, Lauren Henderson, uh, Ken Bruin. So that was basically an anthology where I actually went to authors and told me, surprise me. There was no particular theme. I said, just give me your best new story. And they really delivered. And it's uh, really, it's difficult when you have no theme though, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. like the, the free, there's the lack of freeing constraints. And so sometimes it's more challenging. Indeed. And now, in fact, I mean, that particular anthology, Lauren Henderson won uh, the short story dagger for her story in that anthology, which is I mean, I'm blowing my own trumpet, but uh, the sixth time that uh, a story for my anthology has won the short story dagger. I'm wow. now neck and neck with Martin Edwards. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and, and also both chairman of the CWA. Um, so you, you are a master of a wide variety of genres, and you also seem to combine genres in your work frequently. Um, I noticed, you know, looking through your list, I mean, there's obviously a reoccurring theme of erotica and, uh, and, and so forth, but, you, but also crime, but also science fiction, the supernatural. Um, I, let's see, what did, somebody said something about you that you were the, uh, where is it now? The, um, that, well, that you, that you combine often the, the sort of the dark supernatural with crime specifically. So let's talk about uh, just for a minute, what are the, is that a conscious choice when you sit down to write? You, do you say, I'm going to do a crime slash supernatural, or does it something that just evolves generically as you're composing? I think it evolves. Basically, I began uh, in the science fiction and fantasy uh, field. Uh, I was obviously, like all of us writers, uh, obviously an avid reader. Uh, to the detriment of much else, uh, all through my teens, uh, and uh, both happily and sadly, I managed to publish my first book when I was 16. Oh my. This, and this was in French and in France. Uh, you would have to pay me a fortune to ever allow it to ever be reprinted. <laughs> it was embarrassing. It then took me another 15 years to get another book published. Uh, but uh, And that was a science fiction book because I was initially a science fiction fan. I ran with uh, basically what was then uh, called uh, the new wave of British science fiction in the 1960s uh, with people like Brian Aldiss, Michael Moorcock, who, was a who is a close friend, J.T. Ballard, uh, who was a very close friend. Uh, and obviously that's always been a major influence. But the problem uh, from my point of view is that as much as I like science fiction, I'm not really an ideas person. Mm -hmm. And in order to be a successful science fiction writer, you need ideas. I'm neither am I scientific, I'm more of a literary bent. Uh, so did you also like the Americans, like Heinlein and some of those uh, writers uh, as well? Well, obviously, I read them all from Asimov to Heinlein, mm -hmm. but I was, I was keener on, obviously, uh, people who are maybe lesser known even today, people like uh, Theodore Sturgeon, Philip K. Well, Philip K. Dick, of course. He's well known, yeah. Um, oh, so, so many of them, Philip, Philip Farmer. Uh, so my first love was science fiction. And then I, in a way, I ran out of ideas. And the more science fiction I was reading, the less ideas were available to me because everybody was using them, coming up with these incredible ideas. Huh. And uh, I thought, how can I do something new? Mm -hmm. So, um, and then obviously I moved into publishing and uh, I, was, I was not a science fiction publisher and uh, for quite a few years, neither was I a crime publisher. I'd read crime in my teens, obviously. I was more drawn to what I would term the American pulp and uh, noir hardboiled uh, mm -hmm. school of writing. Uh, and... Uh, Eventually, I reached a stage in publishing uh, where basically I was running publishing companies. So basically, I could virtually do what I wanted as long as, obviously, 
the books were not losing money. And uh, because of because I was brought up in France uh, and I lived in France for over 22 years, um, I was aware that in France, um, a certain branch of crime fiction was thriving. Uh, people who were totally unknown by then because they were long dead and forgotten, both in America and the UK, people like Cornell Woolwich, David Goodis, Jim Thompson, Horace McCoy, etc. So I managed to get hold of old copies of some of those books in English, and I was just blown away how good they were. And it basically showed me that crime fiction could be more than Agatha Christie, Sherlock Holmes, or even Chandler or Hammett, uh, or Rendell or Highsmith, as much as I like them. And uh, so I republished the books, and it started a whole new trend. I published them first in England under an imprint I created called uh, Black Box Thrillers. Uh, and then uh, Barry Gifford um, heard about it and um, did the same thing in America because I only controlled uh, uh, British and Commonwealth rights and uh, created Black Lizard uh, in America. And that relaunched many of those authors. Mm -hmm. Many of them were filmed as a result, many of the Jim Thompson books. And uh, eventually, having published so much, I mean, mostly reprint, uh, I thought, I'd like to try it. I'd like to try writing one. And eventually I did. And it, it came so easily, purely because I was soaked into yes. that noir tradition. Right. And in fact, it also helped uh, that um, in my previous writing, even in science fiction and fantasy, I always had some, I won't, I won't say a sexual element, but there was an erotic element present, uh, which for me, it's, ne it's never been uh, something I've... Um, done uh, willingly. It's just been part of my writing. I, I write about human beings. And another reason why I eventually left the science fiction field is because obviously I'm more interested in people rather than planets or rockets. Uh, and yeah. when, uh, when you have people, obviously, there are relationships, there are feelings, and sex becomes involved. And for many years, my publishers were always saying, oh, OK, okay we'll do the book, but any chance you could cut down on uh, the sex? And I'd always say no. Uh, and um, eventually, obviously, um, as I said, I moved out of science fiction and moved into crime. And the erotic element remained because obviously, uh, hardballed noir fiction, uh, sex can exist. Uh, right. It can be an integral part of uh, the mood, uh, the characters, the atmosphere. Uh, and um, eventually this had a, a a sort of happy ending in so far as uh, publishers always saying, oh, can you cut down on the sex? Uh, and I would always say no. And as a result, my sales were never enormous to say the least. Uh, and eventually uh, we arrived, uh, was it uh, some a, a decade or so ago uh, when people were saying the same things about my crime, they were published in my crime books by saying, can you cut down on the sex scenes or can, can you concentrate more on the plot and less on the relationships? And I would say no. Uh, um, being an ex-publisher, I, I mean, I know the way publishing works. Uh, and uh, the day came when uh, everybody in publishing started talking about this book that a Random House in America and the UK had just bought called Fifty Shades of Grey. And um, by... I was talking with my agent and she said, oh, finally people are going to want uh, sex books. Do you think you could write one? Uh, <laughs> I got hold of an advanced uh, right. manuscript of Fifty Shades, read 20 pages and threw it against the wall, thinking, I mean, this is awful. I mean, it's badly written. The characters are cardboard thin. They're, they know nothing about uh, the demi-world of BDSM, for instance. Uh, it was just wish fulfillment. Uh, let me let me ask you something, Maxime. Yeah. Do you think this disparity between the, the you know the publishers that say this and and ask you for less sex in the books? I mean, do you think that any you know if you think about it? There's a there's a fair difference between the way sex is looked at in France and the way it's looked at in England and, the, and but even more so in the U.S. Do you think that that culturally has any influence here? Um. I think that's I think that's an assumption. Uh, the interesting thing about all my sexier books, apart from the erotic ones, have actually not sold to France. 
Uh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Despite the fact that it is one of my best markets for my other books. That's which funny. Quite, which I found absolutely fascinating. But uh, I'll cut the long story short. Uh, so I decided, and I did it with a friend, because if I'd done it on my own, it would have been a piss take after a certain moment. I decided to write, uh, we decided to write, a sort of a arrival to Fifty Shades. And uh, it was auctioned. Uh, uh, it sold for more money than all my 50 pre previous books together. <laughs> uh, and uh, the first volume came out at number six in the Sunday Times. It was under a pen name. And we ended up writing 11 books in two years. Uh, sold uh, nearly three and a half million copies. And uh, basically, so basically that tired me of writing, obviously, erotica. And I still write the occasional short story, but now I've sort of moved back. And, but... Uh, well, Some of the books I've been writing since, because the final book in that erotic series did have supernatural elements. Uh, so Sophia has uh, asked, what was the big selling series called? Um, I'm contractually obliged not to reveal the pen name of the books, but oh, uh, okay. All half, right. <laughs> half, half the publishing industry knows about it. Okay. Uh, well, and, I'm sure... Uh, we're all good sleuths. We can probably track this down. <laughs> it's, it's, it's fairly, it's fairly easy. <laughs> okay, so let me let me uh, change this into a little bit to the to the two books that you that you brought up to to talk about, because um, uh, one of them, um, uh, the the Louisiana Republic in particular, starts out like a kind of hard boiled classic detective novel you know a beautiful young woman comes to a and this person's never named is he the the detective in this no, he's, not. he's never named uh, could he comes to a detective you know to find her you know wayward sister well we, that's that's a premise we've seen before and it's very <laughs> tried and true <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Stolen from Raymond Chandler. Yes, exactly. And so it definitely harks back to that. But then immediately you throw in a real curve in the fact that now it's suddenly science fiction because this takes place after a circumstance called the dark. Um, which is a, sort of a cataclysmic event in which all uh, all internet and all electronic data has just suddenly been destroyed. And so the earth is set back to pre-computer times and nobody has access to their data and everything changes sort of overnight. And it's dramatic and, and terrible. The, and this, is, this takes place post that apocalypse. So um, in fact, here's somebody on uh, Goodreads said, life after the dark is a world with no social media, no internet, a world ruled by gangs who are not afraid to exercise their muscle and to kill in order to maintain, maintain control. It's, it's chaos, in other words. It's, uh, so you said in the world of this, you now have this unnamed detective trying to look for the missing girl. But there's a twist in that the missing girl before she before she vanished, she was doing something very naughty. And this is why her father, I believe, the commander wants to find her. Is that correct? Indeed. So what was it she was doing? Can you tell us? Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's a bit like Chandler, who, who in many cases, obviously, had people would ask him questions about his plots, and he didn't know the answer. Um, so well, you're you're definitely a, a pantser then in terms of um, in terms of writing. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. I mean, uh, basic for me, the Louisiana Republic. I wanted a typical private eye story, but set against an apocalyptic uh, USA where California and Louisiana, hence the title, have seceded from the rest of America and. <laughs> It's basically, it's a road story yes. by, by yes. river right. down the Mississippi. Uh, and it's my big American book. I wanted to have a uh, journey down the Mississippi. It's also a sort of road movie, which others were. And um, eventually they get to New Orleans, which is cut off from the rest of the world. And there, the book, at, uh, in a way... Uh, topples over into pure supernatural. Yes, I, it, 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 that's another thing. It, it went from, it, it touches on classic crime mystery stuff, and then immediately goes into science fiction, and then, and then another twist into supernatural at the end. I mean, it's quite cleverly uh, evolving in that sense. It's a uh, it's very riveting, very interesting read. Um, I have, somebody just asked a really fun question. I have to insert this right here. Um, is it Norm, Julie asked, 
Is it normal to be asked to tone down or remove sex scenes? My publisher does the opposite. <laughs> I've, in the past, I've been asked to tone down uh, until I became a best-selling erotica writer. Oh, and then they just said, then they stayed quiet about it. Okay. <laughs> well, it's, it's probably depends on your publisher and what what audience you're aiming at. I know. I, I, I feel funny asking you these questions because I write about a man who has no sex. <laughs> oh no, Bonnie! Oh, that's not true at all. Oh, oh, your your most recent book, the, the Three Locks. He's very sexy indeed. Well, indeed. I think he's sexy. That's not what I'm saying. But he. No, but there's a definitely more than an undertone. Let's put it that way. Well, um, but the, but the, who doesn't <laughs> love Sherlock? Well, I think he's sexy, yes, but there are no sex scenes in traditional no, homes. No, there There's, are not. Although there, I believe there is one in your latest uh, anthology. Is that right, Maxime? Sorry. <laughs> I think there is one in your latest anthology, however, uh, a sex scene. Isn't there a sex scene in the your latest Sherlock anthology? Um, With Sherlock? I'm not sure. I mean, copies are arriving within the next few days, so... Okay. <laughs> I haven't read the stories for a year now. Uh, okay. <laughs> and finished copies, finished copies are on the way. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, so le okay, let's go back to the Louisiana um, uh, Republic. I keep saying purchase, but it's not purchase. Uh, but anyway, the, the description of New York City and the description of New Orleans are, it, you must have spent a lot of time in these two places. I never write about places I haven't been to. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah. ironically enough, uh, despite being obviously a British author based in London, I have virtually never set any books in London. Oh. Apart from the initial erotic books in that series, which then moved on uh, to New York, <laughs> to New Orleans. <laughs> New York and New Orleans are my two uh, poles <laughs> of attraction. Uh, and uh, I love the places. Uh, yeah, it's and, uh, clear. It comes through in your prose. It really and in, does. And in pre-COVID days, obviously, I would spend a hell of a lot of time there every, every single year. Uh, right. I mean, even the details of eating beignet. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is in there. I mean, it's really, it, it, it's very transporting, these books. Uh, and uh, Julie uh, asks again, she was told to do more and more graphic. Julie, you need to take lessons from Maxime on how to do this. <laughs> he, he can write a really good sex scene. <laughs> anyway, um, so Jared asks, who are the great, uh, we're getting off the crime novel uh, a little bit here, but Jared asks, who are the great erotica novelists, Maxime? Um, well, um, I mean, there are people known within the erotica genre and there are what I would term mainstream writers who can write wonderfully about sex, uh, whether you like him or not, Philip Roth, uh, Anne Rice, uh, uh, Leonard Cohen, uh, basically uh, Beautiful Losers uh, is one of the best uh, literary novels with sex scenes which feel part of it, and uh, the book wouldn't exist without them. Uh, there is an American writer called uh, Pam Rosenthal who oh, wrote Rosenthal. who wrote two or three books uh, as Molly Weatherfield, which I think uh, Carrie's story was the first, which is a wonderful book. Uh, and in fact, uh, what happened is I, I, for years I was trying to convince uh, my then publisher to do, for whom I'd done quite a lot of uh, thematic anthologies, to do an erotic uh, uh, book of uh, erotic uh, stories. It took me two or three years to convince him and finally, finally said yes. And basically I had Leonard Cohen, I had Martin Amis, uh, I had uh, so many people in there. Uh, but uh, the problem is, um, I mean, the people writing within the, ero the erotic genre itself I mean, there were people like Michael Perkins, uh, the science fiction writer Samuel Delaney, uh, a California writer called Alice Joanna, who no longer writes. Uh, basically, the markets have just closed up. Uh, Would you say that's it, down to the Fifty Shades of Grey yes, phenomenon? 50 Shades, of, Fifty Shades of Grey basically opened up the market for bad imitations, mm. and they just flooded the market, and the good writers then got crowded out. I have a really good friend who, who is a crime writer and she writes the Robin of Sherwood series and everything. And she said that her erotica career just died overnight yeah. when, and, and her publishing house collapsed as a result of it. Yeah. 
No, mm. a few people will. I mean, you can count on one uh, fingers of one hand how many people uh, benefited from uh, within the erotic genre. Mm. benefited from uh, Fifty Shades. I was fortunate to be one of them. Uh, as I said, we sold three and a half million copies. We sold in 31 countries. We were banned in Turkey. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the main character uh, in the initial books was a classical violinist. And the books did so well in Germany that our German publisher was part of the Bertelsmann Group, who also owned Deutsche, the record company Deutsche Grammophon. Uh, and they came up with a suggestion of doing a CD of music from the books. So there was a, yeah. mu there was a CD of music from our books with uh, excerpts from Vivaldi, Mahler. Oh, and, <laughs> that's lovely. And I think people love that. We, <laughs> my co-writer and I still get the royalties on the CD, but Beethoven and Vivaldi don't. Oh. <laughs> I and think that, people love that. that. I think there's a new craze for it. Time. Yeah, yeah, that's lovely. There's a new craze for people doing playlists for their books. <laughs> yeah. So things yeah. that have inspired them or or things that they think go along with it. And you can put these out on, you know, uh, I don't know, Apple and Spotify and everything, and people can just pick them up. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're uh, getting a few more comments about erotica and sex scenes in, in novels. Antony says uh, that he was uh, surprised a little bit about the erotica because one person thought that his first thriller could have been a YA title just because it didn't have any sex scenes. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my goodness. Um, and then uh, I guess, uh, well, there's quite a bit of time. Several people have um, um, said that they like Anais Nin. I guess everybody pronounces that differently. Do you well, like... She never, she never wrote any novels right. of, of an erotic nature. Her novels, in fact, are non-erotic. Cool. Sort mm. of Anais Nin. Well, I don't know why... She did, she did Maxim. She was, she was actually paid, do you remember? I mean, she, no, 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 they, they were short she was paid to do some... No, no, they were short stories. They're all mm. short stories. Yeah, that's right. Her novels, I mean, the cities of the Plain Quartet uh, are of what I would term a non-erotic nature. But her, sto her, her short stories, of course, are wonderful. Okay, well, um, let's see. <laughs> okay, I w I, I, I'm going to ask a question about, about crime novelists. And yes, you yes, obviously have an incredible wealth of experience. And I'm very, very new to all of this. And what would be your biggest piece of advice to a, a sort of emerging or trying to emerge crime novelist in their first year? That's an impossible question, Victoria. <laughs> uh, but purely because I also worked in publishing as an editor and I've worked with beginning be beginner authors, I've worked with, in fact, uh, probably the most modest author I've ever had uh, in my publishing career was William Golding, whose editor I became shortly after he became, after he was given the Nobel Prize for Literature. And uh, I, I hadn't commissioned the book. I'd inherited it from my predecessor at that publishing house. And I came in and I asked uh, the managing editor, so what's on, our, uh, what's on our list of what is being delivered next? And she said, oh, in two or three weeks, William Golding should be delivering the book we commissioned. And I thought, hell. What am I going to do? I'm, I'm going to edit the Nobel Prize for Literature. And Golding came into the office with an old Tesco bag, which was probably 10 years old, and a manuscript, which was the filthiest manuscript I've ever seen. No margins. As, we, as an ex-school teacher, he never used margins. Fantastic. And uh, came in, emptied his Tesco bag on my desk and said, Ah, oh, Mr. Jakubowski, it's lovely to meet you. You're my new editor. Here's a book you commissioned. It was a travel book about traveling in Egypt. And he said, well, there's a problem. And my heart seized, thinking, this is a Nobel Prize for literature. What do I do? Uh, this is not like editing a science fiction or a crime author. And he said, the contract said 90,000 words, but I've written 105,000. And he said, but go ahead, cut anything you want. Oh. <laughs> so, no, no, so going back, I mean, it's not just, obviously, as somebody who's become the CWA chair or somebody, obviously, who's knowledgeable about crime fiction. It's just as somebody who's also worked in publishing. My only advice to whether beginner writers or any is just to get, just to get on with it. Just write the book. Keep true to yourself. Uh, 
try not to follow trends uh, too much, uh, and just try to try. I know it's a it's a cliche, but just try and be as good as you can be. That sounds like very good advice. It's um, can, can it's simple you... advice, but uh, I mean, we do get uh, in publishing or elsewhere. We do get to these questions all the time, and uh, I mean, there is no ideal answer. Uh, you no. just have to believe your you have to believe in yourself. Um, fashion, fashion your craft. Try and get better. Uh, and it, sometimes it takes years. Sometimes uh, I used to get manuscripts from beginner authors where you virtually could didn't have to change a comma. They were like, some people are natural, some people put in a lot of work. Uh, mm. I mean, I make no secret that uh, maybe because my own past uh, as an editor, uh, I only do first drafts. I never do second drafts. Right. And I edit as I go along, chapter by chapter, and when I finished the edit of the final chapter, apart from one quick read through, which will only take an hour or two, uh, just to check on typos and maybe a repetition here and there. And but I know I'm an exception. Some people write. So, yes, editing <laughs> editing as you go. That is quite unusual, I think. Mm, very much so. But, but but every writer has his own comfort zone, uh, yep. and okay. nobody nobody is right and nobody is wrong. So I think <laughs> that Bonnie's favourite question is: Is are you are you a, a plotter or a pantser? Then uh, I'm half a plotter. I need the opening paragraph, and I know I have to know how the story finishes. But what happens in between is I'm going. But in most cases, I'm going by the seat of my pants. Right. Yes, it's interesting. Yeah. I, I've heard that from a lot of people that, especially with crime writing, they know the, uh, the the crime and who did it, but they don't know how how the protagonist arrives at that. Or, or what happens in between, and that's all up in the air. So could you talk a little bit about your uh, the work habits you've evolved over the years? Um, well, basically, they've changed. Uh, when I was obviously in full-time publishing, I was writing less. Uh, and uh, then when I had the bookshop, I thought I would be able to write more. I did write more, but not as much as I wanted, because I still had to go into the shop quite a few times a week. Uh, and um, since basically, um, I mean, I try and I try and get up early in the morning. I try and write uh, two or three hours uh, before I have breakfast. And I seldom, this is fiction writing, reviewing or nonfiction. I can do, I can do any time. But most of my fiction writing now, maybe not in the past, I tend to do between seven and eleven uh, in the morning, and then I don't look at it again until the next morning. And do you start each day by reading what you did the day before? Yes, definitely. And, you know, some people have described that as like coming up to the diving board and you know, bouncing a little and <laughs> jumping in again. Is that? Well, there's always the fear of reading what you've written the day before and thinking, "Oh, this is total rubbish." But uh, it's a risk. I mean, as I said you. Uh, if you're flying by the seat of your pants, so you you keep on flying until it stabilizes. Right. Yes. Um, well, there, there's a the the two books that I read of yours uh, before the, this interview uh, were were both very um, they were surprising the turns they took, and and it felt to me that you know you were pulling the reader along uh, on an unexpected journey. So I mean, it had a freshness to it that uh, it was like the opposite of something overplotted, uh, and uh, I found that a delightful aspect of of the work uh, as a reader. So, um, what do you see as the function of the reviewer uh, in the world of books? Basically, to assess and uh, to assess and review. I mean, you have to be honest. Uh, I mean, I tend to avoid um, giving too many bad reviews, uh, um, particularly over the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, I mean, I've been, I've been reviewing 10 books a month, I, I think for nearly 25, 30 years. I started with Time Out, I did 11 years at Time Out, then another 11 to 12 years at The Guardian, after The Guardian, when The Guardian decided they wanted, obviously, quite understandably, a new voice, and uh, um, Laura Wilson uh, took over from me. Uh, 
then I moved over to an online platform of Love Reading because they, they liked my reviews. Mm -hmm. And then when Love Reading was sold uh, and I had a very close relationship with the uh, previous owner, uh, then uh, Ian Mills at No Exit said, well, come over to Crime Time uh, and do it for Crime Time. So I've been doing it for such a long time and I, I review 10 books a month. Uh, and uh, I mean, I know as a writer, I mean, how much work goes into a book, even a bad book. Mm -hmm. that unless a book really is an affront to me, I will try and not give a negative review. Uh, yeah, it's interesting well, you said, because Michael Deirda, who obviously reviews for the Washington Post uh, and is a Sherlockian, he, he said to me recently that he, he doesn't view his role is as a critic. That's not how he would call his role. Uh, a reviewer, a reviewer in, is more someone who's is trying to introduce and introduce to the public some something wonderful, hopefully, um, and and you know bring it to light, as opposed to telling the author what they should have done. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and also uh, I try and make it a habit uh, every month of having at least two or three first novels. Ah, uh -huh. mm -hmm. help help uh, debut writers, yes. Um, do we have any other questions, uh, possibly from the uh, from the group? I'm looking through um, through the list here. Do you see any that are in the list that I missed, um, Victoria? Do you... I'm, I'm just I'm just I just had a question here about um, one that came up. Do you think there are any traps that new crime writers should avoid um, when when they're writing, particularly a series? Um, I, I've started writing a series, which I'm not sure I ever intended to be a series that, that started off as one book and then they morphed into another. And I, I'm kind of finding that, that there's things that I go back and have to try and check again. But with crime writing, I think there's quite a lot of, of different small traps that we all fall into. Are there any ways you have of avoiding those traps? Well, um, first of all, um... All my crime books uh, have been standalones. I've never written a series. Um, minor characters have come back in one or two yes. books. The main characters never. In many cases, because I've killed them off, <laughs> which would make it difficult. So I make it life difficult for myself. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when I did my erotic series, uh, basically there were two main characters, obviously the male and the female character. And by book five or six, uh, both my collaborator and myself were sick and tired of them. I mean, were yeah. they on? Were they off? Uh, how could we introduce variations? So the books were doing so well that, uh, I mean, we checked with my agent who wasn't too happy, but uh, then I think, it, I can't remember, it was book six or seven in the opening paragraph of the male character leaves the scene with, with a heart attack. But it gave us a chance to, to keep the series going for another five books. Because obviously then she was looking for him in the persona of other men. Uh, because otherwise it was, it was just on, off, on, off, variation on uh, the sexual, obviously, permutations or situations. Uh, I mean, in terms of crime, uh, I've never been tempted uh, to write a series. I said, uh, right now, I'm... Right now I'm at the stage where obviously uh, my latest one, The Piper's Dance, had just, come, just came out a few weeks ago and uh, I'm now beginning to think what I'm going to write next. Uh, the Piper's and, Dance is fascinating, by the way. It's a take on that Pied Piper of Hamelin. Yeah. Uh, and it's science fiction and erotica and mystery. And it's just a, another one of these extremely <laughs> interesting uh, you know, uh, combinations of genres. It's, it's hard to to put it down, and it's also hard to to describe it. But uh, it, it's quite a delight. So uh, I, I highly recommend that. Um, I, mean, I, I term I term it as a hard a hardball fantasy thriller. Yeah, <laughs> it's just. Somebody have a question from Julie as well. Why weren't you drawn to a crime series? Good question. Yeah. Um, I don't think I could sustain it. I think I know my. I think I'm aware of my limitations. Would, would you that, get bored, well, do you think? I don't think I would get bored, but I think the, the readers would get bored. Mm. I wouldn't come up with enough variations. Uh, I find a novel, or at most two or three maybe, uh, is ample 
space or number of pages or words to really get to grips with a character. And mm -hmm. then if you keep on using that character, unless you they age, which obviously uh, many crime writers do, they, uh, they, they age with their characters, uh, um, I don't think I could sustain it uh, and uh, offer the reader a good read. Can I ask you uh, one more question, which is, um, uh, there's kind of a crossover now, uh, or it's spoken of between literary fiction or and genre fiction, or possibly what they call upmarket fiction, which is a seems to be a description of genre fiction that is fancier. <laughs> That, yeah. is, that is, I don't know, uh, supposedly has a, another layer of, of meaning and or symbolism or whatever. Um, would you care to comment on these labels? And um, do you think of them as a reviewer, as a writer, and uh, et cetera? Basically, uh, even though it sounds totally pretentious, I mean, I see myself as a storyteller. And whether the uh, form is popular fiction, and I love popular fiction, obviously, having been involved in science fiction and fantasy, having been over in erotica, in crime. Uh, I love popular fiction, and I've published popular fiction. I read popular fiction. I love, I don't really like the term uh, literary fiction. I would call it more mainstream fiction. Uh, but uh, they can be both. I mean, if you look at Patricia Highsmith, is it mainstream fiction or is it uh, crime fiction? And uh, many authors are straddled. And I am I hope that in a way, I, I also straddle uh, not so much the genres, but the categories. I mean, there are categories which are there for marketing purposes uh, and which have evolved uh, historically over the years. Uh, but uh, I, d I try not to think of it that way. I try to write the best book I can write with the idea I have in mind. Uh, I mean, as, as I mentioned right now, The Piper's Dance has just come out and uh, I'm beginning to think what the next novel might be. Uh, and the last few novels have always come out of short stories. Between, short, between novels, I write short stories. And mm -hmm. in maybe two cases out of three, uh, the next novel has evolved from one of the short stories. It's given me the setting or an anecdote or a character. And then I thought, ah, that idea or that character is worth a whole novel. And right now I'm, I'm considering bringing back actually one of the minor characters from uh, three books I wrote nearly 10, 15 years ago. Oh. I mean, and uh, because obviously publishers are lemmings and uh, anything that sells uh, continues, yeah. it's probably too late, but this character is called Cornelia and she's a, she's a hit woman who's also a book collector <laughs> and who, uh, I like uh, it. Finances her book collecting habit of rare, rare and signed books by uh, working as a stripper when she's not uh, doing hits. It's only when a rare book comes <laughs> on the market that she takes, that uh, she goes to her handler and says, "Okay, I'll take the next uh, killing job." And she's a a minor character in three books I wrote uh, nearly fifteen years ago, and I'm um, I'm sort of thinking now of bringing her back, although I'm slightly worried uh, that. Uh, uh, the Villanelle, the killing Villanelle in Killing Eve. Uh, killing Eve, people yeah. might say that I'm I'm ripping her off when in fact I actually wrote that character 15 years ago. Although she's not as sardonic uh, as uh, Villanelle in the Killing Eve. Uh, and and what do you uh, think of Killing series. Eve? Do you like Killing Eve? I love I like the series. I I thought the books were terrible. Okay. <laughs> now we have we have questions coming yes, thick we... and fast in the chat, Bonnie. Yes, we do. We have, um, um, from, from well, a couple of them we've covered already. Yeah. Um, uh, I think he said why he didn't want to write a crime series. Yeah. Um, and uh, how did he develop his craft over time? I think he sort of answered that as well. Yeah. But um, what, uh, what do you, what do you, what's your comfort read? That's a good question. What that's, do you, you know? good, that's from Jared. My comfort reads are a good crime book or a good science fiction and fantasy book. Uh, I mean, uh, I, uh, even though I'm not a great fan of series, uh, I'll read any uh, any new book by Michael Connolly within a week or so of it arriving. Right. The same with Ian Rankin, the same with John Grisham. I think John Grisham is an incredible craftsman. Uh, and uh, I like cozies, I like hard-boiled. Uh, 
Should what I, did you think of John Grisham's new one, though? The the new way he was going with is it Cam Camino wins? I think it. Yeah. Oh, uh, I love it. Wins. I loved it because it's basically uh, one of the premises of the book is uh, the forgery or of uh, Scott Fitzgerald first editions. And yeah. Scott Fitzgerald is one of, if you gave me te the 10 writers who influenced me most, Scott Fitzgerald is definitely one of them. Can and we I, hear some others as well? Uh, yeah, yeah, I was just going to uh, say, can you give us the 10? But that's putting you on the spot. Yeah, it? The, the 10 is hard, but maybe one or two others. Well, they're pretty varied. Uh, even though he was a close friend, I think he was an incredible writer, J.G. Uh, Ballard. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy was a great writer. Uh, and is still a major influence. Uh, um, on the crime side, obviously, uh, I'd rather not mention anybody alive uh, because obviously, not not just as CWHA, but I've been friendly with almost everybody in the crime world for the last 30 years or so. So I'd rather talk about uh, dead writers. I mean, uh, Jim Thompson was an incredible writer. And uh, one of my major influences is the uh, late American writer Cornell Woolrich, who also mm -hmm. wrote as William Irish, who wrote a short story about him that uh, uh, was adapted as Rear Window, wrote uh, The Bride Wore Black, uh, Night as a Thousand Eyes, I Married a Dead Man. All of them were basically classic noir movies. And coming back to anthologies, I have currently, I have six anthologies on the go, but my favorite one is I've been commissioned to uh, assemble a, an to assemble a collection of brand new stories, all inspired by or in homage to uh, Cornell Woolrich. Uh, and uh, the stories are coming in right now and will be coming in until the end of November. And the book will appear in July of next year under the title, Dark is the Night, because obviously they are all very dark stories. So Woolrich is also a major influence uh, on the mainstream side. I'm a great fan of Philip Ross. I know he comes under a lot of critical uh, scrutiny these days because of his life and opinions, but as a writer, obviously he was an incredible writer. Uh, also, uh, John Irving, uh, The World According to Garp, uh, The Cider House Walls are books that I could go back to time and again. And we should, we'll put you a tiny bit on the spot here. Sophia has asked the question, do you have any favorite female writers in uh, science fiction or crime? Uh, a lot, but obviously uh, it's a question of, uh, if I gave you a name now, uh, then uh, as soon as we disconnect, I'll remember another one. Of course, of course. These, I hate um, these kind of questions when I mean, I'm asked one, these. But... One of the upcoming writers, in fact, which, which I can answer the question uh, in one full swoop because she writes both fantasy horror and crime is the Mexican Canadian writer Silvia Moreno Garcia. In fact, I've just uh, read her new book called Velvet Was the Night, which is a second crime book uh, set in Mexico in the 1980s, uh, which has just come out. And she wrote, she did another one about a year ago. I can't remember the title now. And she also wrote, obviously, on the horror side, Mexican Gothic, which made the New York Times bestseller list. I think mm. she's still very, very young. I think she's an incredible talent. Uh, there's another science fiction writer I am very keen on. Uh, who's a, I don't even know her real name. She writes under a pen name and lives in Brighton called Stark Hoban, who writes basically uh, science fiction westerns. <laughs> which are actually unique. Fantastic. There's and some great ones out there. Hannah Jameson, The Last, is absolutely fantastic. It's a whodunit. It was a but, her end of the world book. Yeah, it's as nuclear had, war has happened. People had, are at a conference in a I hotel. Had, I had reservations about it. Oh, I thought it was just absolutely. And then all of a sudden you're confronted with this concept of somebody's died but okay billions of people have died and there's that whole layer of morality as well that comes in of should we be caring about that well yeah we do care we do care who killed the person in the water tank and i love that book i absolutely love that book. i thought it was so well put together and all, all the way through i was asking the question well billions of people are dead so do we still have any system of morality left? Well, yeah, hopefully we do. Interestingly, it seems to be becoming a new subgenre. Mm. Obviously, uh, some years, about four or five years ago, uh, 
the American writer Ben, ben H. Winters wrote uh, his trilogy about the last policeman, about yeah. a policeman in mid-West uh, America who's been given a case, and this is like two weeks before the end of the world because a comet is arriving which is going to destroy civilization. But he's still keen on doing his job. And yeah. Book. And I just read, in fact, just three weeks ago, I'm also reviewing it in my next column. Uh, I mean, talk about somebody I also admire, I mean, uh, is Chris Whitaker, uh, who won of the, uh, the Dagger this year and won the Creasy when I was chairing it some years ago. And he's just written a new book, but it's a young adult book. So I haven't seen mm -hmm. any reviews of it so far. And it's also what is going to happen to the characters in the two or three weeks before the end of the world. And it's called The Forever. So there seem to be quite a few end of the world books coming. Right, out. I think it's, it's, yeah. the, it's the zeitgeist right now, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, few, I, think, yeah. I think, is it Margaret Atwood who calls it kind of future fiction? So we could have kind of future future whodunit fiction. And then uh, there's a, a final uh, author, I mean, who has written crime. I mean, she's now, now she, she started as writing crime, but she now, she's now seen as more of a literary author, is the, Canadian, the young Canadian author, Emily St. John Mandel, of course, who wrote Station Eleven. Uh, I love Station Hotel, Eleven. Uh, and her early books, I mean, her first novel, I think, is one of the best novels of the last 20 years. And it's a crime novel. It's called Last Night in Montreal. It's, it was done by a small press in America. It's now available from Picador. And I would really recommend it very strongly. Mm. Station Eleven is a fabulous book, absolutely. And again, with that whole, should we be caring about the whodunit aspect? Well, we still do, you know, whatever happens. Yes, yes. And I think we should probably um, thank Maxime very much for this Generous appearance. So first up we have Stella Oni, who is there. Um, and her book is Deadly Sacrifice. It's a thriller that's been shortlisted for the SI Leeds Literary Prize. It's her debut police procedural. It was published in September 2020. And this is about human trafficking and ritualistic killing. It was inspired by a real life crime that happened in 2001, when a torso was found in the Thames. So very interesting stuff. Take it away, Stella. Thank you very much, Victoria. I hope you can hear me well. We can hear you very well. Okay, fantastic. So I'm gonna start and I'll try to read slowly. <laughs> when Detective Sergeant Philip Dean and Detective Constable Tooks Adi stepped out of the warmth of their car into the chilly embrace of a winter day. A disturbing, gruesome find was the last thing on their mind. With the wind whipping at her neck, sharp as razor blades, DC Tooks wished she had remembered to bring her woolly scarf. Let's hope we're not chasing shadows, said Philip Dean. Shadows, she asked, glancing sideways at him, was a tall man with thinning brown hair, pale skin, and a downcast expression. She had come under his wing as a trainee detective at the Stanford CID unit in East London when her appointed supervisor became ill. Nothing, don't worry about it, he muttered. They were at Cedar Estate, a sprawling human cauldron of a place, to visit a Mrs. Bello, whose nine-year-old granddaughter had gone missing two days before. Tox was here to act as a Yoruba interpreter. The team that came to interview Mrs. Bello had complained they could not understand her or she could not understand them. Who knows? This would be her first proper case on the unit as a detective. She was relieved to be out of police uniform after 10 years. Yoruba, Philip didn't change the subject. I'm trying to learn. Do you know any Igbo or Hausa? No, just Yoruba. She did not let her surprise show at his knowledge of the three main Nigerian languages. She continued to scan the area as she spoke. Mrs. Bello's flat was in one of the many tower blocks on the estate. She heard some laughter and saw that on the other side of the path were low walls surrounding a wide raised concrete platform that acted as a bridge and entry to four tower blocks. In what she thought might be Mrs. Bello's block, she had a communal build of overflowing discarded furniture, 
mattresses with foamy entrails, chairs with missing arms, a gas cooker with a blackened heart. She saw a few boys joyfully kicking a football through puddles of yesterday's dirty rainwater. As they approached, Tok saw that the boys had stopped and were crouched over something on the ground. She suddenly felt a tingling in her belly from her uniform days. You okay there, boys? She called out. They jumped back and turned pale, shocked faces to the detectives. A boy with spiky blonde hair pointed a shaky finger to the ground. A hand! Whiskey found a hand! He seemed to wake up the rest as they tried to all talk at once. Talks turned to a pimply boy of about 14, who seemed to be the oldest. He said his name was Tommy. He was desperately trying to contain a Yorkshire Terrier that was whipping itself against his leash, adding, to his friendly, adding its friendly barking to the confusion. Whiskey brought it to me, he said. He dropped it at my feet. I thought it was a stick. I... His voice broke. Philip Dean waved his hand. Boys, move back. And let's see. With an eye kept on the boys, Tots watched him take a long look at the thing on the ground before turning to her with a grimace. Welcome to East London CID, Detective Ade. He slid his hand into his faded fisherman's jacket and brought out his food. Tots stared at the tiny human hand, severed at the wrist, little fingers swollen and split like a bunch of rotten bananas. There was a stench of gone off meat. Could it be the missing girl? She dismissed it. That was only two days ago. She turned back to the boys, thankful, thankful that none had tried to leave. Boys, I'm Detective Adi, and this is Detective Dean. We are police. You're not wearing uniform. Are you undercover? Asked the little boy with the spiky hair. Talks of her head snippets of Philip Dean's conversation as she answered the boy. Cedar Estate, he said, his eyes on their find. Once he finished the call, he turned to the boys. Detective Ade here will take your names and addresses and will call your parents. It's on to Tokes. I'm going to get some tape to cut on up this area for the scene of crime officers. With the image of the hand still imprinted in her mind, she moved the children to the side. There were six of them, jostling restlessly with varying expression of awe and shock on their faces. They looked dirty and unkempt in their clothing, except for the spiky head boy. He was smart in his designer trainers and jogging suit. It was hard to imagine that any of these boys had been playing and jumping less than five minutes before. She picked Tommy, the pimply boy. The terrier had not quietened its barking to low growls. Can you tell me what happened with your dog? Whiskey's not my dog. She's Sarah's dog. That's our neighbor. He shuffled from one foot to the other. That's right, miss, one of the other boys said. The spiky head boy suddenly started to whimper and then burst into tears. Are you going to arrest us, miss? Because I've got to go. She's not going to arrest us, said the chubby boy. She's going to ask us about the whisk about what whiskey find, like on TV. Tokes had to, had to stop herself from smiling. What's your name? She asked the boy. Andrew Jones, miss, 36 Forest House. He pointed to the block, he, he pointed to the block on the right. Conscious of their widened eyes on Philip, who was cordoning off the area with red crime scene tape, she quickly took their details. I also need to take your phones, she said, knowing that, that pictures of the find will be nestled in some of the phones ready to be um, zapped into Instagram and Snapchat. Miss, we need our phones, said Spiky Boy. I promise we'll return there, but I need to speak to your parents before you go. She held her hand out, and with low murmurings and grumbles, they handed her their phones. Right, she turned to little spiky hair. Shall we start with you? Talks made the calls one at a time and spoke to parents and carers, conscious of Philip's movements. Some sounded anxious and other indifferent. She made careful notes before turning to the boys. You can go now. Your families are expecting you. As if in silent agreement, they turned and ran. Soon, each disappeared into a block. The now empty space held the ghost of their previous laughter. Thank you. That was fantastic, Stella. Thank you very, very much. That was really evocative as well. I love the bananas. Uh, that was just fantastic. That was just brilliant, brilliant. 
scene. Fantastic. Thank you. For, how are you enjoying your 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 year as a debut? Oh gosh. It? It's nearly a year now. So uh, next week, I think actually, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, it's nearly a year next month. It goes so, pretty quickly, good. huh? It's good. Yeah, lots, lots of um bloggy bloggers, interviews, leads, you know, appearances and libraries and all that. It's been good. Oh yeah. Thank and, you. And, and and we're gonna have some more, are we soon? Are we yes, the second to study, but I'm being naughty because I wanted to write something really light, so I'm writing a cozy mystery at the moment. I'm nearly done with that one. Nothing yeah. wrong the with start a cozy of a new mystery. series. We love a cozy mystery. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's a new series set in um, Nightbridge. Fantastic. So, we love Nightbridge very, as well. <laughs> with a quirky, quirky character. Very, very quirky. And fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stella. Thank that was you. absolutely brilliant. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And lots of good things in, in the chat as well. So have oh, a look at the thank chat. you. <laughs> so next we have Anthony Johnston, who um, is no stranger to the CWA and is of course the creator of Atomic Blonde. And he's going to be reading to us from The Tempest Project, in which an MI6 hacker, Bridget Sharp, is battling a series of hacks and ransom attacks um, on politicians and government officials by the mysterious Tempest. The dark web of cryptocurrencies and Russian hackers and oh. African rebels as well is all involved in this book. So take it away, Anthony. Thank you, Victoria. Yeah, um, so I'm going to be reading from Tempest Project, which is the second uh, Brigitte Sharp book. The first book you can see behind me, The Exforia Code, and the third book, The Patrios Network. I'm literally finishing writing pretty much as we speak. It's due in like six weeks. Um, so I'm just coming to the end of the first draft now. Uh, I'm going to be reading from just over halfway through the book. So for some context, um, Brigitte who, as you said, is an MI6 hacker and field officer following the death of an Estonian journalist called Archem Kallas. Bridge is now on the trail of Tempus, a mysterious cyber criminal who is blackmailing politicians and civil servants. And this has led her to a young hacker in Tallinn, Estonia, called Roman. And she's cornered him on a local tram. As we pick it up, she has just observed him talking to the mysterious Tempus via text message about the blackmail. Oh, and I should point out, there is a shadowy villain in this story called Maxim. I swear it's just a coincidence. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Bridge released Roman's fingers and tossed his Huawei phone back in his lap. You think I'm going to kill you over ransomware? What the hell's going on, Roman? What are you and Tempus up to? Roman stuffed his phone in his pocket and glared at her. You've lied to me from the moment we met. Why should I believe anything you say now? He had a point, though hypocrisy gave Bridge pause. You didn't answer my question. What are you and Templus planning? And why create a, a fake cryptocurrency to do it? He looked at her with mild surprise. What do you mean, fake? Oh, don't try to bluff me, she said. I figured out your round-robin bots inflating the currency all on a single exchange. What I don't understand is why you don't set the value yourself to a thousand dollars or whatever you like. Roman hesitated. Do you know the story of how to boil a frog? She did. The story went that if you placed a frog in a pan of boiling water, it would leap out. But if you placed it in cold water, then slowly raised the temperature, the frog would stay there, acclimatizing as the water heated up until it was boiled alive. It was an analogy for how people would more readily accept gradual change over time, even if the predictable end result was disastrous. It was also complete bollocks, as Bridge had found when she once used the analogy on a news group, only to discover two of its regular members were biologists, sick and tired of people thinking frogs were so stupid they wouldn't jump out when they got too hot. She didn't say any of that because she wanted to keep Roman talking. Instead, she said, yes, I know the story. So what you're saying is you want the coins rise in value to look natural. Exactly, he said. Make people think that everything is fine. Bridge took a leap. 
This is nothing to do with the hacking workshop, is it? Maxim doesn't know anything about this. Roman's eyes widened and darted involuntarily up to the bulging CCTV hemisphere in the tram. Oh, come on, she said. You can't seriously think that he has live feed access to tram security. I've hacked more difficult things for him myself, said Roman. And if he knows I'm talking to you, he'll kill me. I'm not exaggerating. I'm sure you're not, she said. Bloody Russians, eh? Terrible bosses. Roman half nodded and Bridge took some satisfaction at several more suspicions being confirmed. Maxim did run the workshop and he was indeed Russian. This was going well. Did you write Ratcatcher 4, Maxim? She asked. That's good code. Took some of my best work to neutralize. Roman turned away to the window, pouting, but not before his reaction to flattery had given him away. She pushed further. Does Maxim know rat catcher infected Russian machines too? Or was that an accident? Roman looked sideways at Bridge, opened his mouth to answer, then closed it again. There was something he didn't want to tell her, something she was missing that he'd assumed she already knew. This is justice for Archim, he whispered. It made sense. Revenge, said Bridge. I understand. Roman's eyes flared, suddenly angry. You don't understand, you stupid bitch. You're all to blame. And so am I. He began to cry, which threw Bridge completely off guard. Her mission instinct told her to take advantage of his state and get him in zip ties so she could bundle him off the tram and back into town. But what good would that do? She was gaining his trust, no matter who he blamed for Callus's death. It's not your fault, she said. You mustn't blame yourself. You didn't pull the trigger. Notwithstanding her hazy vision after the crash, Bridge was confident that she would recognize the gun-wielding thug from Paris who had killed Callus if she ever saw him again, and it definitely wasn't Roman. Maxim had Callus killed, and you want to make him pay. I understand that. But there's a way to make this right without scamming thousands of people with ransomware. Trust me. Archam was the only person I ever trusted, he said. Make it right? Fuck, you think this is about money? You think I'm that shallow? The tram slowed to a stop. Bridge looked out the window and saw their surroundings had become more rural, indicating they were probably near the end of the line, and Roman slammed into her, shoving her backwards off the seat. Bridge's head smacked into a metal railing, and she dropped to the floor, dazed, as Roman launched himself over her to leap off the tram. A couple of passengers fussed around her, but a quick exploration revealed nothing more than a lump on the back of her head and wounded pride. Amateur hour. She should never have taken her eyes off Roman. By the time she reassured everyone she was fine and left the tram, he was gone. But she took out her iPhone and launched an app. A blue dot pulsed in the centre of the screen, overlaid onto a map of the local area. Bridge opened a menu, tapped again, and the map zoomed out to accommodate a second dot, green, positioned at her exact location. That was her. The blue dot was the GPS in Roman's phone, loud and clear after she cloned it. Cloning was difficult, as it required close proximity to the target for a minimum of 30 seconds. But sitting next to him on the tram had given Bridge the perfect opportunity. She made a mental note to pass on her thanks to whichever staffer at GCHQ had written this app when she returned home, and then Bridge set off at a steady pace to follow Roman. Oh, that's fantastic, Anthony. What a brilliant reading. That's Thank you. That's really cool. I loved that so much. And as I spoke to you earlier about, I now have lots of uh, fantastic gifts for my husband that I can <laughs> My husband were, it was um, a hacker for the particular institution that is in there. <laughs> and he's out now. And uh, I, I'm always looking for a Christmas gift. So that would be fantastic for him. Well, I do, hope you do, enjoyed it. do you do lots and lots of research for the kind of the, the GCHQ stuff? I do a fair amount. Um, I do. I mostly research the technical side of things. That's yeah. kind of my area. But my 
genre interest has always been in spies and espionage. I um, must say you have made it sound a way more interesting than I have ever heard. I mean, it's fiction, of course. <laughs> I'm dramatising, yes, you know, to make it sound more interesting. I'm well aware that real spy work is actually incredibly dull, but nobody wants to read that, you know. I'm very much in the uh, sort of classic Cold War style of cloak and dagger and, uh, you know, I'm trench coats and shadows. going to massively put you on the spot now, Anthony. Favourite spy author? Oh, John le Carre. Of course. Uh, that's not, a, how can it even be a question? Yeah. Did you, did you like The Night Manager? Yeah, oh, yes, of course. Yeah. How many times have you watched it now, Anthony? <laughs> Only the one. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so, so much, Anthony. That was absolutely brilliant. Thank and you, we yeah. have our, our last reader of the evening is Paul, who is a regular on here and everybody knows him, hopefully. And you've all just moved around again. So, Paul, you're now next to me. <laughs> <laughs> and Paul is going to read from us to Out of Sight. It's his newest in the DCI Warren Jones series. Um, the first in the series appeared in 2014. Am I correct, Paul? Yeah, that's right. Fantastic. Following the DCI in the, the Middlesbury Force, he is also a fabulous writer of writing tips that I have been following. Paul, <laughs> your writing tips are absolutely amazing. And anybody out there who, who is, you know, looking for any tips whatsoever, brilliant. And most recently on his blog, it's a brilliant, brilliant section that is writing science comfortably. And you've got a huge science background, I think, haven't you, Paul? So... Um, yeah, I did. Um, I was a research biologist was the start of my career. And then I switched to being a science teacher, which I'm still tutoring now. So, uh, yeah, I just thought I'd, I'd just write something this week about suggestions about how to write science comfortably, particularly if you don't actually have a science background. I absolutely would never do that, even though I have read your blog. I would not touch that with a, a <laughs> 10 foot barge pole. The same as with with writing about police procedure. Or, I don't know how people do this. I would need someone sitting beside me to mm. assist. As a lawyer, I never write about lawyers either. That, that was <laughs> absolutely impossible, just winging it the whole way. But <laughs> thank you, Paul. And you're going to read to us uh, out of sight, I think. Is that correct? I am. Yeah. So uh, just to put it in context, this is the seventh full length of the DCO Warren Jones series. Uh, there's four novellas as well. Um, I'm going to start off with the prologue and I'm going to read the first chapter. And to, to give everyone a little background, if you don't know it, um, Warren had a, uh, Warren became, he, he became an orphan relatively young. He, well, he's, his father died and his mother struggled a little bit to look after him. So he's, so his grandparents became his substitute parents. So um, those who have been following the series will know that his, his beloved grandfather is now well into his 90s, um, and, and uh, this is causing some stress. So when I read the first chapter, that just gives you a bit of context as to what may, may, may have gone on here. But we'll start with the prologue. Five days before the new moon and the country lane was close to pitch black, thick cloud obscuring what little light was available. The car headlamps, dipped to minimise unwanted attention, illuminated the shallow brook between, uh, beneath the bridge. For the next few minutes, the stillness of the night was broken only by grunts of exertion until, with a wet thump, the wrapped bundle splashed noisily into the lazy flowing stream. A bare arm flopped loose of its binding. Quiet descended once more until the sound of metal on bone and teeth startled the creatures in the underbrush. An unseen bird squawked loudly, its wings fluttering. For three miles outside of Middlesbury, in the middle of a late November night, Nobody was there to hear it. Okay, chapter one. The house was cold, not just because of the late November weather or the lack of heating, but because it was empty. Warren Jones turned slowly on the spot. The kitchen was old fashioned. The new owners would need to rip it out and replace it. The bathroom was also past its prime. He tried not to think about the changes that were coming. The kitchen had been the same for as long as he could remember but now he barely recognised it. He'd never noticed how the wallpaper had faded until he'd taken down the photos and the clock. The lino linoleum floor was shiny with wear, 
four small indentations, the only evidence of the wooden dining table that he'd sat at for so many years. With the leaves folded down, it had been just the right size for three people to eat dinner or for him to do his homework. Fully unfolded, the table had doubled in size. With his eyes closed, he could picture it laden with food. How many Christmases and birthdays had he celebrated here? He could almost smell his grandmother's cooking. They had never had double glazing fitted, and he remembered the dripping condensation every time they had a roast dinner. Reaching out, he scraped a trace of blue tack off the wall with his thumbnail. Christmas was less than a month away, but the ancient decorations that his grandfather hauled out of the loft each year were now gone, sent to the council tip down the A45, along with everything else the charity shops had turned their noses up at. A handful of ancient baubles that he couldn't bear to part with were wrapped in bubble wrap in a box in the back of the high van parked outside, along with some old books and childhood possessions that he'd never quite got around to moving to his own home. This year it would be another family's decorations hanging throughout the house. Somebody else's Christmas tree in the living room. A different collection of voices would be laughing and singing and loving each other. He hoped they would be as happy there as he had been. He felt his wife's arm snake around his waist, her head resting on his shoulder. Do you want me to take a photo? For old time's sake, she asked him quietly. Warren shook his head and swallowed the lump in his throat. No, I have plenty of pictures. Back from when, you know. I'd rather remember it that way. That's the first thing he'd do when he and Susan arrived back at Middlesbury that evening, he decided. His computer's hard drive was full of images that he was sorting and printing out, all of them treasured memories. Newer digital snaps of recent gatherings, older ones with Warren and his grandparents from Christmases before he even knew Susan, and scans of faded prints of Warren, his brother, and his mother. There were far fewer than he'd like with his father also in shot. Even when his dad had been alive, he was usually the one behind the camera. Selfies a technological impossibility with a point-and-click 35 mil. He pushed back his sleeve to look at his watch. It was almost 11 o'clock. Susan's parents would be back from church soon, and Warren and Susan had promised that they'd all meet for lunch before vis visiting the graveyard and then driving the van to two hours back to Middlesbrough. Suddenly, he wanted to go. Ever since Grandad Jack had had his fall, the house had ceased to be a home. The old man had never spent another night under its roof and what was a house without its owner. Warren took his keys out of his pocket. The key to his grandparents' house was the oldest one on the bunch. He still remembered the, his grandfather handing it over to him the day he started secondary school. So you could let yourself in if you pop, on, pop in on the way home and we're out. He felt so grown up. Soon it too would be useless. The locks doubtless changed within days of the new owners taking possession. He twisted it off the key ring. Let's go. We could drop these through the estate agent's letterbox on the way to lunch, he said, turning and walking briskly to the front door. Following him, Susan said nothing as they emerged into the weak autumnal sunlight. A faint buzzing came from Warren's coat pocket. Stopping on the threshold, he took out his phone, looking at the caller ID. I need to take this, he said. Today was booked as a rest day. His colleagues knew that he was busy this weekend. It must be important. Answering the call, he listened intently, asking only a few questions. Eventually, he hung up. We need to get back to Middlesbrough. Can you drive? I need to make some calls on the way. I'll text everyone and let them know we won't be meeting them for lunch. We can post the keys when we get back. Why? What's happened? Asked Susan, although she could already guess. They found a body. That was brilliant, Paul. Thank you very Thank you. much. And and that is number seven in the series, is it? Yeah, seventh full length, yeah. So, yeah. Have you got any big tips for people writing series? How do we keep people hooked in? Uh, keep track of characters, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah uh, a bit of a bit of a series. I mean, I haven't got a Bible. I'm not that organised, but I have a, I have a sort of table that has things like their, their dates of birth on, which sounds really pedantic. But actually, if your series is going to take place over several years, um, people are going to go through milestone birthdays. There are yeah. characters who may find themselves coming towards retirement. Um, it can even give a little bit of inspiration. Uh, for example, I have a character who's approaching middle age now, and he's he's not stale. But you know, I was wondering what can I do with him. He's just he's just another character. I thought I know he's going to be fifty soon. I'll give him a midlife crisis. He can have a motorbike. Um, so you know. I would say, yeah. Fantastic. As Agatha Christie would say, don't start your characters off being old people. 
No, no, I have to get rid of some. They might actually become very popular characters who go on for a long time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> be over 100 years old by the end. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paul. That was absolutely fantastic.